may have noticed that every song deals with the leadership of God in our lives. We ought to think about that more often. And the scripture reading and discussion from 1 Samuel 17 certainly puts our hearts and minds, along with these songs and prayers, in tune with the principle of can we trust in God? And why should we trust in Him? And what is He able to do for us? His providence, His protection, His presence. All of these things are basic, fundamental Bible teachings. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 66.7, He ruleth by His power forever. Psalm 93.1, Jehovah reigneth, He is clothed with majesty. Romans 13.1, There is no power but of God. Romans 3.4, Let God be true, and every man be found a liar. And the last paragraph of Romans 11, which closes the deeper doctrinal section, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans. An inspired writer is overwhelmed with what he's inspired to write. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given unto him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? For of him, by him, to him are all things. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, we're always to serve God with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. And that word Sabaoth, sometimes brethren rush through that and say Sabbath. It's a totally different word with a much different meaning than Sabbath. Sabaoth means the Lord of the hosts of the armies of heaven, the all-powerful, almighty one. I believe we should describe to him glory and power as we often sing because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Romans 5 verse 5. And since Jehovah changeth not, Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 to 8, and since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13 8, and he has promised to be with us even the end of the world, Matthew 28 20, his constant leadership is something we should submit to, surrender to, and that most gladly. I've always loved Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. And the next chapter has almost an unknown, unsung verse, Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. When Paul wrote to Titus, Titus 1, verse 2, Titus on the wicked, evil, uh, licentious, debauched island of Crete, the most wicked place in the Roman Empire. He said, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. And in nearly every funeral, a preacher will quote Psalm 23, 4, probably out of context, but it still is a powerful verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. First Timothy 6, 17, Paul told Timothy, put the brethren in Ephesus, Put the brethren in mind not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And when Jesus came, he didn't give us just a little smidgen of, just a little bit of hope and love and joy and peace. Uh, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10, verse 10. And when Jesus stilled the storm, the people exclaimed, the disciples, What manner of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey. And that was just a physical, temporary storm on a sea in life in the transit, passing, fleeting world. In Mark 7, 37, this exclamation, I believe it's a key verse in the book of Mark, a book of power, of what Jesus did more than what he taught. Mark 7, 37 culminates that by saying, He hath done all things well. Have you known some people who can do a lot of things well? When it comes to mechanical things, about all I can do is start the lawnmower and turn on the radio. And I know some guys that can repair anything and everything and can even explain how it's done and so forth and not cut their fingers off or their toes. I borrowed a fellow's lawnmower one time years ago on Wednesday night, uh, on Wednesday afternoon, and it had a higher lift than mine did. And always in my yard when I used my old mower, I'd put my foot on the top of the thing to swing it around and I'd put it under that one like I cut my toe off. And I had to stand there that night with my toe going, <laughs> Well, I was trying to teach a lesson. That's just how mechanical I am. I can't do anything well when it comes to those realms. But here's Jesus, the master of earth and land and sea and everything. He has done all things well. I'd like for someone like that to help me, wouldn't you? A.M. Murray wrote this, one of my all-time favorite poems. 
Someone ought to set this to music when we sing it. They cannot shell his temple nor dynamite his throne. They cannot bomb his city nor rob him of his own. They cannot take God captive nor strike him deaf and blind, uh, nor starve him to surrender nor make him change his mind. They cannot cause God panic nor cut off his supplies. They cannot take his kingdom nor hurt him with their lies. Though all the world be shattered, God's truth remains the same. His righteous law is still potent, and Father still his name. Though we face wars and struggles and feel their golden rod, we know above confusion there always will be God. One preacher said something is, but something cannot come from nothing. Therefore, something has always been, and I call that something God. And that's what the Bible says in the beginning. God created the heavens and earth. And God said, let us make man in our image. God spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. We need to appreciate that sentiment of Psalm 33, 9. And so we're dealing with someone who created the world and everything in it. I believe, as he said to Job, Job, if I can make the world and everything in it and control the most savage beasts and the uh, hugest animals and so forth, couldn't I take your little puny life and make it worthwhile if you'd just surrender and let me? There's irony in that. It comes kind of close to sarcasm. But he's getting his attention with these words of irony. Words, you don't even know anything about the beginning of the universe, and I was there, I created it, I made it. Surely if you'll just hush and let me take your little puny life and make it worthwhile. And you know what Job said in Job 30, verse 20? I cried unto God, and he didn't hear me. But as I often say, he hadn't read the last chapter of his own book. For Job 42, 12 says, God blessed the latter end of Job morning his beginning. And in Job 13, 15, becoming more and more aware of the weakness and frailty of his wife and three best friends and all mankind and himself, and how great and powerful God was, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Habakkuk said, and I'm not using common vernacular parlance to sort of make a commentary on what Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Though there's no cattle in the field, no crop in the barn, no food on the table, no clothes on my back, no money in the bank, still... I will trust in God. We're going to prove tonight as we continue in this that he is trustworthy. That we ought to trust in him because any earthly trust we place in weak humanity will come to naught and disappoint us. Let's talk a little bit about the presence of God. He will guide you continually, as if 58.11. He'll keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on him, as if 26.3. If God be for us, who can be against us? God who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors to him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, no things present, no things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The magnificence of what I believe is the greatest chapter in the Bible, Romans 8, beginning with verse 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. Young Samuel said, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, which in the Hebrew means command and I will obey. And that should be our attitude too. And we ought to say with Isaiah who came in the presence of God and extolled his virtue and power, Hear my Lord, send me. Isaiah 6, 8. And as David said before that giant almost ten foot tall, I come to you in the name of the God of heaven and earth, the Lord of Israel. And he'll give you into my hand this day. The confidence was not in his own ability and strength and power. He was just a young shepherd boy. His confidence was in the God of heaven who will take care of us. Haggai came along in his day, and the word Haggai means the, fast, the festive or happy one. He had a right to be happy. He came into a situation where for 16 previous years the people were idle. While they really stole the uh, cedars of Lebanon that had been imported to refurbish the temple that had been burned by Nebuchadnezzar for their own luxuriously paneled, finished houses while the temple of God lay waste. For 16 years, zero. He comes along, and in 24 days preaching the truth and never compromising it. They accomplished more than they had in 16 previous years. And he speaks for God when he says, from this day will I bless you. And a lot of people aren't blessed by God because they don't put their trust in him. He said, if we'd seek first his kingdom, all these things, and he speaks of food, clothing, and shelter, shall be added unto you. The problem is not the provision of God and his ability to provide and 
show his presence in our lives. It's our inability to surrender to it. From a prison cell, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He said, our God will supply all our needs. And even mentioned there were saints in Caesar's household. Almost an impossibility. For the Caesar then was Nero, despotic, tyrannical, terrible Nero Caesar. And yet there were saints in his household because of the power of the message Paul preached that caused him to be put in prison in the first place. Our God will be, will show his presence in our life and he will provide. And in Mark 10, 30, Jesus said, No one's given up anything for my sake in the kingdoms, but what in this life he'll receive a hundredfold and in the world to come, eternal life. His presence in our life. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Revelation 8, 4 and 5 says the prayers of the saints come up as sweet smelling incense before God. Heaven knows when the saints pray. And thus John said, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God and such we are. 1 John 3 verse 1 and 2 we love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 18 and 19. The source of love, of dedication, commitment is the God of heaven. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2. He sees the end from the beginning. He is my help and my deliverer, Psalm 70, verse 5, an unsung verse, and my very favorite verse in all of Psalms, and probably my favorite chapter to read, and any time I talk to someone on the phone who's going to the hospital or in the hospital or they're sad or bereaved or whatever, one of the last things I do is I say, read Psalm 46. It's that kind of source of peace and surcease and power and beauty and calmness. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and be cast into the depths of the sea. In Psalm 107, 21 and 31 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works, the children of men, we have so much to be grateful for. He will guide me with his counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Psalm 73, 24. All this in heaven too, in other words. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in him. Talking to Christians. We have this confidence in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Ask, seek, knock, and it shall be open to you. Many times we do not accept the presence of God in our life and then wonder why we have so much trouble and so many problems. The Bible is replete with passage after passage that tells us how much heaven loves us. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 1 Peter 3, 10 to 12. Now let's talk about the protection of God. There's just no end to this. We could preach all night long on what the Bible says. I mean, let me put it this way. The Bible says enough that we can preach all night if we just knew it well enough. But the protection of God. I count one of the greatest promises of the precious promises Peter mentions in 2 Peter 1, 3, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But it wasn't written to the world. It wasn't written to faithless members of the church, but faithful Christians. He said, there is no temptation taken you, but such is it common with man. But God will provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Whatever comes, if you're a loyal, faithful Christian, you know that you and God can see it through because he's promised to open a door that you can walk through and hold his hand and walk down the road of truth. Protection, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. I always get the fellas when I teach in the school of preaching, and I don't mind making assignments from the pulpit to members and congregations. I've been known to do that. Uh, First uh, Peter 3, 10 to 12 that we mentioned, and other passages that tell us, like Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. Do you like to read different kinds of Bible literature? I believe the strangest cadence in the entire 150 Psalms is Psalm 124. Go home tonight and read those eight verses of Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. And when he comes into that, he said, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Oh, what a blessing it is. In Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The strange thing to me is I've heard somebody that pray for everything in this life and the world to come and then saying, Lord, that'll be enough. Well, it ought to be. There's nothing left to ask for. But he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
That's a marvelous statement. Before a bunch of heathen outside Lystra, Acts 14, 17, Paul said, God left not himself without witness, and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Turn three chapters over, another bunch of heathen in the intelligentsia center of the ancient world, Athens, standing before a bunch of idolaters and philosophers who gathered to hear and tell any new thing. He said, I want to tell you about the God of heaven. He isn't very far from every one of us. And in him we live and move and have our very being. We're the offspring of God. James 1.17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow, cast but turning. Have you read the first two chapters of Job lately? The devil said, I'll tell you why Job's a good man. Speaking to Jehovah face to face, nothing timid about him or shy about him. The devil said, well, the reason he's good is you've hedged him about. You won't let him out. I can't get to him. You can look till your eyeballs fall out to find where God said, I do not have him hedged about. The devil told the truth there for a nefarious purpose. But we are hedged about. We are surrounded. We are protected. And it's only when we break through the hedges that we get in trouble. Revelation 20 says, from the death of Christ onward, Satan has been bound. And there's no way the devil can get me or you unless we let him get us. When we walk into the periphery of the mad dog's chain, he will gobble us up. If we're that dumb, it probably ought to happen to us. But the point is we are hedged about. Jesus said, I've entered the strong man's house and spoiled his goods. Mark 3, 27. He, identi he identified Satan as the strong man in Luke eleven twenty two, and quickly said, but a stronger than the strong man is here, referring to himself. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4. For this cause was the Son of God made known that he might bring to naught the power of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. We have the protection. We have the citadel of truth, the bulwark of righteousness. But only when we wander out where the devil operates do we get in trouble. If I have a single favorite context from the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament, It'd be the last paragraph that he ever wrote before he died. Just before Nero put him to death. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. He said, at my first defense, no man stood by me. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me and shall preserve me into his heavenly kingdom. Puny, fleeting, transient, finite people forsook him. But God, the almighty, eternal one, came to his aid, bolstered and strengthened him. Yes, the protecting hand of God. Exodus 14, 14, before the seemingly impassable gulf of the Red Sea, they sang the song of Moses mentioned in Revelation 15, 3. Our God will fight for us. Save on the other side, as they looked back and Pharaoh's host drowned in the very same place where they'd been escaping from, our God will fight for us, and he did. What did the three friends of Daniel say? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God is able to deliver us. Daniel 3, 17, and he did. Have you read Revelation chapter 1 carefully? When Jesus introduced himself, Revelation 1, 15 said his feet were as though they'd been a fiery furnace. What did that heathen ruler in Babylon say? He looked in that fiery furnace, he said, that's strange, I put three men in there, but one like unto the Son of Man walks with them. Jesus is saying centuries later, I'm not one like unto the Son of Man, I'm the very Son of God. And I'll walk with you in a fiery furnace. He has that protective power. Well, let's talk about the providence of God. And here's where a lot of people really have a time understanding the principle. Some people say, oh, that's a miracle. Miracles ceased when their purpose ended, and that was to confirm the word of God. And that was 2,000 years ago. Mark 16, 20, the purpose of miracles, confirm the word. Do you believe the Bible is confirmed, authenticated, that it's God's will? then the purpose of miracles ceases just like the purpose of scaffolding when you're building a skyscraper ends when the skyscraper is finished and you take down the unsightly scaffolding. We have something more powerful than that. But the point is there's a difference in miraculous power and the providence of God. The providence of God operates in natural law. And we haven't discovered all of natural law. God knows all of it. I mentioned the other day in a lesson, 40 years ago or more, when we were living in Odessa, we got a, Long distance phone call, an urgent one, saying rush to Corpus Christi, Iris' mother's dying. I think it was seven doctors, both in Houston and Corpus, that had concluded there was no way she could live another 24 hours. And she was in desperate straits. 
we observed her 88th birthday that day. You know what the doctors told us the next day? One of them said, God knows something we don't know yet. Said, and you prayed that if it be Lord, the Lord's will that she live, and it evidently wasn't. There's no miracle to it. It was the providence of God. And we need to make a difference. But did you know the Bible just reeks with statements wherein servants of God believed in the providence of God, that he was the one in charge of things? What did Joseph say to his brethren when he made himself known to them and they knew for sure he had snuffed out their life because of the way they treated him? I love Genesis 45, 5. He said, God sent me before you to preserve you. Now, if you had asked them how in the world did that work, they would have said, we sent him down yonder in slavery for him to die and told our father he was dead. And for years that lie had been perpetrated. His father was brokenhearted. But this one they thought they were rid of and through with Saved 75 of Abraham's seed and brought them to the land of Goshen to preserve Abraham's seed so Christ could come. See, the providence of God and the obedience of men go together. What if Joseph had refused to stand in the gap and do God's will? What if he had snuffed out their life and subsequently the hope of the Messiah? But God's providence gave him the opportunity to be benevolent and beneficent, and he was. And the parting shot in the last chapter of Genesis 50, 21, he says, what you did, you meant for evil. But God made it for good. What did Mordecai, the faithful Jew, say to Esther in Esther 4, 14? A decree had been signed on such and such a day, unbeknownst to them, Abraham's seed would be snuffed out, annihilated by the ruler of Persia and his army. Wicked Haman plotted against Mordecai, the faithful Jew. He hated him so much. Get rid of all of them was his motto. Built gallows out there to hang Mordecai on. Mordecai comes to Esther and says, you need to go in and appeal unto the king, lest we die. She said, but if I go in unannounced and uninvited, it can mean my death. Mordecai said, who knows, notice, who knows what you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this? What if she had refused? She said, I go into him, and if I die, I die. But instead of her dying and Abraham's seed being wiped off the map of the earth so the Messiah couldn't come, the immutability of the Persian rulers was world and out, but the immutability of God Almighty was greater. The providence of God. What did Paul write to Philemon about Onesimus, the runaway slave? They came from Colossae. Paul had converted Philemon earlier. Now he converts Onesimus and sends him back home. But this letter we know as the, know as the epistle of Philemon. And he said, perhaps, notice, an inspired writer, guarded about the providence of God. Who knows? Now what, you come in the kingdom for such a time as this? Remember Esther 4.14? Now he says in Philemon verse 15, perhaps he left thee for a season that he might return to thee forever as a brother beloved in the Lord. The providence of God, the goodness of men, the cooperation of humanity before the Creator, the Almighty. And when you have that combination you really have something. I'll tell you a passage to go home and ponder. And if you do, and if you go home and read it tonight, you won't forget it for a long time, maybe ever. In Ezra chapter 8, verse 22, when the Persian ruler offered to help Ezra and his entourage, you remember what uh, Ezra said? Ezra was the one who prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel's statutes and judgments. Ezra 7, verse 10, he said, I was ashamed to ask the king because we had told him we trusted in God. We ought to be ashamed to think we've got to depend upon government rulers and patriotic things and anyone else. We need to trust ultimately in God. I believe the prayers of the saints bombarding heaven are worth 10,000 telegrams sent to your congressman. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is reproached to any people. Proverbs 14, 34. We're told to pray for the rulers of the world as our brother did. That's scriptural. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2. That you, the Christians, might lead a tranquil and peaceful life in all godliness. But this idea of I depend upon government to protect me when we have the providential hand of God that saved Abraham's seed so Christ could come in spite of the immutability of the signet ring and the decree of Persian ruler it said. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your care on him. He cares for you. And Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. One of my all-time favorite gospel songs, because I remember it from the time I was about five years old. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. In every way, through every day, God will take care of you. 
And so when I arise each day, I know that God has promised if I do his will, he'll take care of me. Now that might mean I die that day, but blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The worst thing my enemies can do to me, they think, is kill me. And that's not bad. That's good if I'm a Christian. Years ago, a black congregation in the Tennessee area invited Brother Marshall Keeble, the beloved uh, black evangelist, to come preach and challenge, uh, preach to and challenge the brethren to be better givers every first day of the week. About 60 of them were giving $20 or so. But anyway, he said, I'll preach everything the Bible says on the subject. And I mean, the walls cracked nearly. Brother Keeble had a masterful way of telling the truth. And it was just stunning to these people who hadn't been taught to give like they should. The preacher came up to him and said, you're going to kill this church. He said, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That may be the best thing Brother Keeble ever said, but really and truly, God will take care of us, even the end of the world, his providence. Daniel said there is a God in heaven, Daniel 2.28. And he rose in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4.25. And you know, when I go to bed at night, there's where my trust is. It's significant when they came back from the first evangelistic tour, they rehearsed all that God had done through them. Here are some of the great verses of Second Chronicles, an unsung, almost unknown book. I believe this is the pivotal verse in the entire Old Testament. God's part and man's part blended. Second Chronicles 7.14. Make that the verse you memorize this week. And you'll thank me someday. Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. We cooperate with the providence of God if we want the blessings that emanate from God. You remember what Gamaliel said? We don't want to be found fighting against God. Acts 5.39. All right. Let's have a little discussion now why a Christian should never worry. I'm telling you, we're giving you enough stuff to... I'll just take $150 from each one of you because I'm solving all your problems. You can throw your medicine away. It's amazing. One time my mother was in the throes of a nervous breakdown and she was too concerned with what others said and did and so forth. That's just the way it works sometimes. So I said, do you want to have more peace of mind? Read the book of Psalms every night before you go to bed. Then when you get up in the morning, read the book of James and it'll say, Sickle. go out there and go to work for the Lord. Then it'll be time to read Psalms again she wrote me back and said, that's the best medicine I ever got. And I wrote her from college and said, send me $10, please. But <clears throat> you know why we should never worry? Never, ever worry. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There it is right there. Best prescription you ever saw to counter worry. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. I've been young and now I'm old, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Psalm 37, 25. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Who's writing this, Paul? Where is he? In prison. He writes to brethren who are free. And he, the prisoner tells those who are free, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord's at hand, and nothing be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your request be, mo be known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But preacher, sometimes I just don't understand why God allows that and why he tells me to do this. And, well, Abraham trusted in God so much that when Jehovah told him to offer that son the seed of promise, you know what the Bible says? He believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. What faith? Probably the greatest statement on faith and that whole chapter on faith. Heroes of faith. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. First Peter 1, 9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. There was an old song we used to sing. I don't think it's even in any songbooks anymore. I haven't seen it, much less heard it in years. I know my heavenly Father knows and tempers every wind that blows. See, if you really believe in the God of the Bible, why worry? Put your trust in him. Henry Van Dyke is the greatest religious poet I've ever read anything after, and he has a poem called Peace that I hope I can remember. I know I remember the gist of it. With eager heart and will on fire, I sought to win my great desire. Peace shall be mine, I said, but life grew bitter and endless strife. My soul was weary, my pride wounded deep. To heaven I cried, God give me peace or I must die. 
The dumb stars glitter, no reply. Broken at last, I bowed my head, forgetting all myself and said, whatever comes, God's will be done. And in that moment, peace was won. You want to quit being a worry ward? Put your trust in God. Absolutely trust in God. Obey His will. Live in harmony with His teaching. Now let's notice some things that God provides. And has promised to provide. And has already provided. Thus, would it be difficult for Him, in view of all these things that He provides, would it be difficult for Him for take, to take care of you or me in our struggles in life? If He would send His Son to die for us, anything would be less than that. If he is willing to do the maximum, can he take care of some of these minimums? And so God provides a Savior. Call him Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. Luke 19, 10. We have seen him to testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John 4, 14. For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved, John 3, 17. If he'll provide a Savior, I believe I can handle the lesser things and trust in him. He provided an example. Our first song tonight, Follow the Footsteps of Christ, based on 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, who did no sin, it was God found his mouth. He is an example that we're to follow. He didn't say, just get out there in the world and root hog or die. He said, I've sent my son to show you the perfect pattern of life, and if you'll follow in his footsteps, you'll wind up where he is, and he's now in heaven for us. Hebrews 9.24. John the Immerser was the forerunner of Christ, and so Jesus followed where John had led. Jesus is our forerunner. He's called that in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. So if I follow him, I wind up where he is, and he's in heaven. The problem is in following him through Gethsemane and Golgotha and through suffering and loneliness as far as worldly companionship. He's provided us a genuine hope. Hope to the end for the grace to be revealed in you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 13, we're saved by hope. Romans 8, 24. He's provided a Savior, an example, a genuine hope. He's provided brethren to encourage us, and we ought to encourage one another, not discourage one another. We ought to be a fortress, a citadel of helpfulness. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, 1. And here's the best verse in the Bible on fellowship. I'm a companion of all them that fear thee, <clears throat> and of them which keep thy precepts. Isn't that beautiful? Psalm 119, verse 63. He's provided joy and peace. 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8 tells us of the joy that we have because we have followed Christ. And it's given in abundance. Tribulation is mixed in there with it, but it provides ultimately joy and peace. We're the pure gold that survives the furnace of affliction, is the point he's making there. With joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's not an empty promise. That's a powerful, powerful statement. He also has provided us a challenge to do better. Challenge is still my favorite word. And again, any time brethren have let me edit a bulletin or let me name the bulletin, I've called it the challenge or the challenger. I think it's the greatest single word in the Christian to apply to the Christian religion that we have in our vocabulary. Some people don't like to be challenged, and as a result, they never amount to anything. I like the statement, the motto, we can if I will. You know what this congregation could do and do pretty quickly? Fill this whole building in a hurry if every member said, I will do my part. But when we have this clergy lady concept that we pay a preacher to study for us, visit for us, live for Jesus for us, it just won't work. There's no proxy religion found in the Bible that God approves. The point that we're making is we're challenged to do better, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Not just stand still, but go forward. 2 Peter 3.18 he also gives us the comfort of the scriptures. The things written aforetime written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Romans 15, 4. And so preaching and teaching should be uplifting. I don't mean that we can't rebuke error. That's a part of the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 27. Keeping back nothing that is profitable. Acts 20, verse 20. But it's interesting that after saying that to the elders of Ephesus, as Paul bade them farewell for what he thought would be the last time in nobility, he said, Brethren... I commend it to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Edified, strengthened, built up. I'll be in Knoxville, Tennessee in about uh, two and a half, maybe three weeks, three weeks from today, I guess, and uh, to open a lectureship there. And they've asked me to preach on edification. 
edifying one another. And what the Bible says about building up the body of Christ, that's going to be a challenging lesson, but it's one everyone ought to hear. I'm not talking about what I say about it. We all ought to study the Bible for those things which edify and make for peace, Romans 14, 19. And what has he given us? The power of prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 16. Men ought always to pray and never to faint, Luke 18, 1. And he's also given us the motivation to be influential and to die in Christ. Your are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. One of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in all my life, and I believe I've heard more preaching in my day and among people of my age than anybody else. From the day I was 10 days old, I've been in the church house. Morning, noon, and night. Gospel meetings, you name it. By the time I was 10, I'd heard more preaching than most people do who die at 100. And I'm thankful for that. But one of the greatest sermons I ever heard, Brother C.E. McGoy preached from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. I don't believe when I've ever been impacted, as people say today, with one lesson that challenged me to think of the importance of my influence. Let no man despise thy youth. You listening, young people? Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And now let's notice in closing what God protects us from. I believe we've circled this thing about as many ways as you can, but this is important closing material. He protects us from ourselves. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not he that commendeth himself is approved before God, but whom the Lord commendeth. 2 Corinthians 10, 18. He protects us from Satan. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in your faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. He protects us from sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. This next point is very important. You may think it's the strangest insert into this lesson. I believe it fits here perfectly. Listen carefully. He protects us from mediocrity. There are a lot of people who aren't even trying to grow. They kind of get nervous when a preacher challenges them. They'd a whole lot rather just take a nap and snore. But when you challenge all of us, including the speaker, to get out of the rut of mediocrity, you get into people's rest time and nap time. We're going to have to be challenged to cease our mediocrity. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have needed someone come again and teach you, which be the first principle of the oracles of God. And become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, because you have exercised your senses to know the difference in right and wrong. That's the bluntest thing. The book of Hebrews has. And so he delivers us and protects us from mediocrity. Launch out into the deep. Go on into perfection. Luke 5, 4. But too many people like the shallow waters of do nothing. He delivers us from fear. Oh, we're to stand in awe and sin not, Psalm 4, 4. We're to fear God and keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. But we're not to fear God in that the sense of shrinking back from him because he's wanting to knock us over into hell and shout with glee because of it. We stand in awe of him. We have deep respect for him. But he delivers us from the fear that the world has. Matthew 10, 28, Fear not him who is able to destroy your body, but is not able to kill your soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God had not given us the spirit of fear or of timidity but of discipline and a sound mind. He also delivers us from burdens too heavy to bear. Jesus left heaven and came to earth to release us from burdens of carnality and sensuality. He wants us to not be burdened with such things, but to be burdened with the souls of men that need to hear the gospel. You know, in 2 Corinthians 12, the greatest Christian we have any record of, Paul said, I besought the Lord thrice, again and again and again, to remove this thorn in the flesh. But Jehovah said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you, and you'll grow strong because of trials. And he did. And writes 13 or 14 of the 27 New Testament books in the midst of suffering, and it draws us nearer to God and realize, makes us realize we can overcome too. Whatever the problem may be, 
in any realm if we just walk hand in hand with him down the road of truth. Have you read Psalm 119, verse 67 and 71 lately? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. It has been good for me to be afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Where would we be without adversity? And last of all, he delivers us from the gloom of the grave, from that pessimism that seems to overwhelm so many, many people. Have you read Numbers 13? These men going to look over the promised land. And there's a land flowing with milk and honey. But there are giants in the land, they said. We're grasshoppers in their sight. And if you read the last part of Numbers 13, it says, because we were little in our own eyes. So we were in their eyes. But we read on in the book of Joshua, and when they get into the land, they find the people in the land were afraid of them. And a lot of times we go through life pessimistically, looking like an old dog that's been hitting the head of the rock. It scoots along on the ground with kind of one eye looking like that. I've got too many brethren like that that are perpetual pessimists. Were it not for the optimist, the pessimist would never know how happy he wasn't. Remember that. A pessimist uh, doesn't like when a knock comes on the door. It disturbs him. It takes up some of his time to complain, you know. We need to appreciate the fact that there's no place for pessimism when it comes to children of God, and therefore we're not pessimistic when we view the grave. Oh, death, where is that sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is law, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's come to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. So we even view the end of time and death and that sort of thing, separation from this life in a different light than those who have no hope. First Thessalonians 4 discusses the end of the world and what's going to happen to those who die in Christ. He said, you are to sorrow, but not as those who sorrow without any hope. I believe we present enough Bible passages tonight to make us the happiest, most buoyant, optimistic people on earth. If we believe the scriptures and believe in God, this is what he's bequeathed unto us. You've listened well, and how I hope all of us, including the speaker, will incorporate into our lives these bountiful, beautiful promises that enrich our lives. Let's sing a couple of stanzas of this great old song. And if there are those here who need to bring their life into harmony and compliance with God's will, now's the time to do it. To be baptized into Christ if you have not done that. Galatians 3.27. To come back to the Lord, Acts 8.22. And may all of us leave here tonight enriched by the sacred text and challenged to live a life walking more closely with God. Let us stand and sing.